that one, every recruiter is basically saying the same thing. They're all using the same message of, we have this great family and work environment. One thing that's wrong with that is, uh, I don't know what your families, but some families maybe you don't want to work in a family work environment. And the second piece of that is we're making an assumption. And one of the things that we talked about in January, we did a recruiter sales training, is when we make assumptions that drivers are gonna feel a certain way about something, even if you think it's positive, it doesn't always end up being that way. So like a really easy example, I talked to a recruiter a couple weeks ago. She said, she's on a call with the driver, and she said, oh, we, we have non-force dispatch. And the driver goes, oh, I know where this is going to. And you click, and you hung up on her. And she's going, why would any driver not like non-force dispatch. He had some bad experience in the past, and you have no idea why he disliked that. Um, so we talked in the, in the recruiter sales training, how can you flip the question around so that you don't make those assumptions and automatically assume that a driver's gonna like something? Yeah, I agree, Chad. I'd like to have mentioned just any more of the fact that saying that you are a family owned operator company or saying you know, something along those lines, you have to find a way to physically show that. Um, one thing we've tried doing recently is you know, just advertisements, I guess, if you want to call them advertisements, but they are basically content with no words. So how can we show someone what we're about without trying to say, this is what we're about, we're gonna actually show it. I've looked at a lot of advertisements lately, and the mind-numbing saviness of them is amazing. So even if you have a great story, you're not telling it well in any way that makes it stand out. And I think that's the other thing too, is what's going to differentiate and what's going to make you look a little bit different. And I, I, I happen to agree with Chad. Some people really have dysfunctional families. And the idea that they can go to work in a family environment actually is a turn off. So, you know, maybe your family is great, but don't don't make that assumption for everybody. So, what are the concrete ways to actually figure out what you should do in a marketing message? Is it's actually a it's a very holistic view. So we're talking about recruitment, but what you really need to look at is everything that you're doing from a driver, even from a driver feedback standpoint. If you're doing driver surveys, you're doing driver voice and driver, or you're calling drivers, whatever it is, getting that feedback, and you're finding out, hey, what's going on in our company that's disruptive or frustrating you? What are the good things? What you should be doing is saying, I'm gonna take that information. If it's the good things, I'll take that. If it's frustrations and we make a change operationally, I'm gonna take those instances and I'm gonna use those as examples in my marketing and my advertising. So you're basically creating your own content by what you're choosing to do as an operation and that's what you can use in your marketing message and change your ads up. That way you know for sure that you're gonna look 100% different than the next trucking company because it's based on the decisions that you made within your own company. So instead of just doing a now hiring ad, you're now doing a, hey, we changed our health benefits because of the driver said this. And you can actually even state that based on driver feedback, change this. And that can be an ongoing marketing campaign just from driver feedback to what we change. So that's a one concrete idea. Yeah, it's, you know, we talk about this as a whole life cycle. Uh, I think once we dive a little bit deeper into the retention side of things, uh, that's that's a great point because we're getting that information, we're getting that feedback, and we're doing something with it where we can we can uh, then show action, you know, and then use that for uh, for to improve the, the marketing and advertising. Now, how would you uh, you know? There's a lot of different ways to advertise. Uh, what what is what do you see that's working the most today? I, you know, I think yesterday we had a conversation with somebody. Social media was was a high you know priority for them. They were something that was very effective. Maybe we can dive into that a little bit. What you're what you're doing for your clients, Chad, and, and then uh, Nick, maybe what you're seeing in success as well. Yeah, number one for a lot of carriers is still going to be referrals. Um, I think a lot of people are still stating that referrals are their number one source, which is a is a good thing. Um, so we can talk about referral programs because I think most referral programs are actually constructed in a very what I consider a lazy way. There's a way to actually get more referrals on your, so if you're already having success, I believe there's some very concrete ideas on how to get more success out of your referral programs. Um, but number two, typically now, is, is becoming Facebook. Uh, a lot of people are having a lot of success with Facebook, uh, specifically making sure that their ads come through as a Facebook messenger, so they can start a conversation with a recruiter immediately. Uh, that's, that's been the number two. Um, down below number two, we've been having a lot of success personally with Google AdWords driving, so we're using digital digital ads to drive people into there as well. 
And so using Google AdWords is a, it's a very popular one. And then after that, we're getting into our shop boards, into some more of the, what you consider more of the traditional marketing that you're having. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, for us, referrals is by far number one. Um, so keeping that in front of our people, we, we quarterly change the, our actual referral program. We'll do a different bonus structure one quarter, next quarter we may do um, you know, a gift card or gift card equivalent if you can't get a gift card a certain amount of match check or bonus check. But we still keep it fresh, do something different each time. We're always looking at new ideas. I mean you have one that we're actually working on. Um, Facebook is also a very large one for us. And one thing we found out how to do was to take um, our Facebook feed or our Facebook advertisements and tie those in with some geofencing stuff as well. So that way when a unit is placed a particular geofence that we set, they're not only dealt our ads or within applications or or news channels or anything like that, but they're also fed a 15 second video on Facebook for the next 30 days. Um, so that's really helpful as well. It's some sort of retargeting then so yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of yeah, retargeting with what? Facebook. One thing I would suggest on the Facebook and any of the digital marketing side, if you have somebody in house that's that's handling digital marketing, every single year, Facebook and Google are updating what's going on in the back scene. You should be, if you have somebody on staff that's handling that, make sure that every year they're actually going out and getting that that knowledge base to bring back in house. Um, because what ends up happening is one thing I learned in 2017 on what's the target audience size that you're going after, what's geographies, and how I'm setting it up. All of a sudden in 2018, that totally flipped. Where once I was saying I need to target as many people as possible, that actually recently Facebook has become internally, it's become better at targeting people properly. So what happens is now is if I narrow down my audience to a smaller size, I actually get a better result, which seems very counterintuitive. And you would not have any idea that that's happening unless you're going to getting ongoing education. So if you have somebody announced, make sure that they get that on, ongoing education, make sure you're invested in and I think just to add on to that, it's important to track what's working and what's not. So, uh, to, to again, to your point, if it's not, you know, things are changing and all of a sudden what you're doing in a certain method is, you know, starts to deteriorate, then you've got to, you've got to be able to track that and pay attention to that, not just throw money at uh, the at problem without uh, seeing good results. So, I want to talk about, real quick about driver referrals because I think all of us can here understand that the best ambassadors that we have as, as fleets are drivers that work for you that really like you and uh, so those they're great ambassadors out there they're going to say this hopefully uh, it's a similar message to what your recruiter does but they are uh, it's, it comes across more genuine right so so what are we talked about the fact that you know some people might uh, implement a lazy type of uh, driver referral program what are some good ones? what are some things that we can take home as that is something that we can start doing right away so I can take that so I, uh, uh, so just for background, State Metrics does surveys and we also do a reward program. One of the popular things in the reward program is to reward driver points for referrals. So one of the things that I've been doing is how do we do that better and how do we not have a, a more lazy one? And I stumbled upon a, a, a company called Expeditus. Um, you go out and Google it. They have this really interesting way of approaching referrals, which is that the, refer, the first time a uh, driver refers another driver, they uh, get X, whatever X is, but then they continue to get X while the driver that they referred is there. But then if the driver that they referred refers, they get something else. So I call it sort of a, a pyramid scheme, but like one that works in your favor, like not a bad one, that anybody's going to go to jail for, right? Yeah. But, but the idea is that we're, we're we not only are referrals a great source of drivers, but consistently they show up as the best source of good drivers. So the drivers that stay come from the referrals. So this is a different way of thinking about how to submit that that process. And I, we were talking about it earlier. Nick, Nick likes the idea. I love that. Hey, we're a percentage-based pay, so coming up with whatever that equivalent, if we try to go for a mile, whatever, so coming up with that percentage equivalent and how it will tally up as, you know, if there's a chain you know, of five people who all started with this one person, how are we going to account for all these five people on a percentage-based basis? 
Yeah, we're definitely working. Uh, from a referral standpoint, some of the concrete things that we put into place, uh, which we've been having a lot of success with, is one, when I talk about a lazy program, what I, what I mean and by that is that usually a trucking company will put out and say, hey, there's a $1,500 bonus for referrals. And then they just kind of expect drivers to come in and give us referrals and have to pay them out. Uh, but we can be proactive in it in a couple of reasons. One is there's a difficulty, I think, for recruiters, but we also have, I also think about operations. Uh, thinking about when they should be asking for referrals and how they can ask for referrals. The when is a little bit interesting piece because you can say, well, anytime they have another week that they've been here or when they've been here three months or whatever it is, it's like you can almost ask for a referral all the time. Um, so one of the things that's been really useful is, is teaching people to ask for referrals when a driver finally comes back and says, thank you for something. So when a driver's had a good experience and they're talking to either operations or the recruiter or whatever it is, they come back at any point and say thank you. When someone says thank you, they, they initially feel like, hey, I'm kind of in debt to you. I'm thanking you for something. And that's the perfect time to actually ask for a referral. Hey, you know, if you could do me a favor, you know, you just had a great experience. They're going to do that. There's actually a very specific script you could go through as far as how to ask for that referral. The other piece that we've been doing is making sure that we are actually creating a communication and marketing plan to our existing drivers. So one thing that we've been doing is every single month we've been getting in the hands of drivers information. And that information right now is been consisting of, hey, here's the, dri the driver referral program, here's how much you can make off of that. And then here's one piece of information that is why drivers would, look out, would want to come here. So something in your company is, is done really, really well. Could be you have amazing health benefits, could be you have some, the rider program is amazing, you have health whatever it is, you just you remind them of one thing. What it does is, one, it gets them to remind, hey, we're, we're taking referrals, you can make money off of that. And two, just as a reminder, here's one of the good things we do and why you work here. So it kind of works as like a double-edged sword because it's also a retention tool as well. And so every month we'll give that to them. So that's a really concrete idea. If you just want to do a marketing plan to your existing drivers in that way, it'll really help. Um, and then lastly, the one thing that we're in the developing right now is actually creating short like 60 second to 90 second videos of um, we're sending out sales, technically sales training to the drivers. So it might be something like how to start a conversation with a stranger or I don't like people. How do I get, how do I get referrals? Right? So like if you're a very introverted person, how do you get referrals as a driver? So, so there's things that we're starting to train them. That's also going on with those programs. So it's part of that marketing and communication plan for drivers. Well, and that's an interesting point that I'm going to touch on in a minute as far as sales in general and the fact that recruiting is sales. But before we get there, I do want to talk about, you know, let's assume that, that we're doing all the right things, right? We, we kind of uh, define our strength, our, our core uh, strengths, and, we are, and we're conveying that in a way that stands out, right? So we're able to attract people. How, you know, one of the things that I'm a, a huge proponent of is, is the applicant experience. And, and I like to say that better recruiting begins with a better applicant experience, but I'd like to know, you know, from you guys, what uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how important is it that the, uh, especially in today's uh, economy, where it's not just trucking, by the way, every every industry that we know are, are clamoring for a shrinking pool of available candidates. So it's, you know, from my opinion, I think it's it's very important, but I would like some input from you on that on that topic. Um, it's interesting to see that there's still carriers out there that have websites that are mobile friendly, um, but even websites that haven't been updated in five years. Uh, there's things that have changed from website, SEO, everything that you do from a marketing standpoint that should have changed in that time frame. Um, we know drivers are on their phones. They have to have an application that's mobile friendly, that's easy for them to fill out. Um, technology, when we're talking about social media, using Facebook Messenger, I mean, that's we're getting into this very one-to-one -one communication style uh, versus the one-to-many. And so needing to use technology is just it's becoming a foundation of just that's the basics. And so if you're not even doing that, then you're not even getting the basic level, what I would consider carriers having to do. So I'd make sure a couple things, uh, make sure that your website is up to date. Um, you might, if you have a web programmer or you've worked with a company in the past, things haven't been updated in a few years, there are things that need to be updated. Guarantee you on the backside that you're not you're doing yourself a disservice. Of basically, hopefully, some free marketing, um, and then your recruiter should be using 
anything that's mobile. So if there's text messaging communication, can be handled that way versus Facebook messaging. Um, they have to have a good experience from the application. If you're still requiring them to fax in an application, which I still see, um, that, that is the low rung on the ladder to I think the ATA has made us all very well aware of how we have the driver shortage right now. So if a candidate is you know, filling an application out for me, there's a good chance that that person's filling someone out for someone else just sitting in this room. So if I'm not able to give back to that person quickly, somebody else might give me to that person. Uh, touch on the Facebook Messenger thing, one-to-one. -one, um, you know, don't don't have your the auto replies turned on. Um, one thing we try to do is we and one other person manage all of our Facebook messaging and all of the content, the comments and all of our social media stuff. But one thing we take a lot of pride in is being able to answer a person's question with a real legitimate long one answer within about 15 minutes. Um, our goal is, you know, 15 minutes or less. Uh, usually we can stick to that and stay pretty close. We feel like that's, that gives someone an avenue to actually get to a real person and ask a real question and get a real answer rather than pose a question, get an auto reply, thanks for your question, someone will be with you shortly and, you know, in the next day or two, somebody gets around to, to messaging that person back. So just being, I think, present, you know, on the social media scene has helped. With our efforts quite a bit as well. I think you know one of one of the things. So I think we can all agree that the fax back caddy wolfus application that looks like it hasn't been changed since 1980 doesn't present your company as well as it possibly could be presented. You know, and, and applicants can be quick to judge on things like that, like fax. Who besides the doctor's office wants a fax machine anymore? Like I haven't faxed something. My doctor's office wanted me to fax something. I like. I don't even know where there is one right now, you know? So I, I think those things are definitely the negative takeaways, but there is a positive side, right? I, I believe in, in looking at, you know, designing an entire experience. So you design the applicant, intentionally design your applicant experience, intentionally design orientation and other things, but so that, you know, if the applicants go into 10 different companies, let's say, if it's talking to you, talking to 10 other people, What's going to make you stand out? You know, they're talking to ten people. What what is it about their encounter with you that is different, and that reflects who you are as a company, so that they remember? Wait, these were the people that fill in the blank. They made me feel different. They made me think different. You have that opportunity to create that. Wow, that's up to you. I mean, you always have that opportunity. Don't be complacent. Put it in there. Make them go. Wow, no one's ever done that before. And I, I think that's, you know, the well may be that they get back to 15 minutes, but once everybody's heard you give that away, what's going to be your next job? We'll that one way. But what's going to be your next job? Everybody's doing it. It's not a wow, right? So what's going to be your wow? How are you going to set yourself in the Yeah, and I think it's what you say, by the way, within that 15 minutes, you know, this would help. We mm -hmm. kind of get into the sales uh, part in a second, but you said applicants are quick to judge, and I think absolutely, I think, and, and Chad mentioned earlier the importance of, of, of making sure that your website is modern and mobile friendly and all those sorts of things. Nothing is worse if the driver goes to your site, which by the way, I promise you, today they're looking you up before they apply. And that's just happening all the time. And it's easy to find you, right, because of the, you know, uh, uh, you know this device that everybody has. And so when they do find you and they see that uh, you have a, looks like you have a blog, oh, let me click on that. It hasn't been updated for four years. You know, there's uh, it's it's an old antiquated. It's just that's not the image that uh, you really want to uh, to convey to them. And they're able to find you pretty easily. Last door, Indeed, you know, stuff like that. They're going to find information about you. So not only to, to that end, I think it's important not only that uh, that your messaging is good and on point, and you, and you manage your the the the, uh, the visual the drivers get about you, but also that you are honest and true because if you're saying here's who we are and everyone else is saying here's who they are that's that's not good and they're going to listen to those people before they listen to you by the way um so nick you mentioned uh 15 minutes right you mentioned you get you know, in touch with people for 15 minutes and one of the things when i have conversations with carriers and they, and they complain or about the challenges they have hiring drivers one of the things that they say you know i just i'm getting applications but you know i just i'm not able to hire people and when you look at their process, you talk to them about it, a lot of times they'll say, 
you, you'll see that they've got applicants that they haven't reached out to or contacted for three or four days. I mean, you just can't do that. You know, how important is that? You, you made a decision. We have to, you know, within 15 minutes, you recognize how critical that is. Exactly. I think as far from an application standpoint, same day is you know, the critical point. It has to be same day. Um, you know, but it's something as simple as a Facebook question or comment or something, uh, I feel like needs to be within 15 minutes for us. So uh, now, we talked about sales a couple times. You know, Chad mentioned the fact that uh, uh, he even has some uh, sales training for recruiters, for driver, or for drivers, for driver referral purposes. Uh, Chad, you hosted a, uh, an event here in India that maybe that was about recruiting, you know, this, this sales. Maybe if you could speak to that, and, and if we can all just kind of chat about recognizing uh, the importance of, you know, not just answering some questions, but how do you frame things in a little bit better way to, to really get them over the finish line? Yeah, sales for recruiting training is, I think, something that a lot of carriers are missing out. It's one of the shortcuts. So we usually hire a recruiter, hey, sit with the other recruiter for a while, learn from them, that's about it. Without ever thinking that maybe that other recruiter that we're sitting from also never had any training as well. Um, and we treat drivers as professionals, but then for some reason, as recruiters, we're not treated as professionals. We're not given the professional development that other people would uh, normally get in an office setting. And so it's, it's interesting to me that that happens. Uh, so, hey, you've been working for the company for 12 years, why don't you be a recruiter and just start today? Um, so I think that the, tr the training aspect is really important and where I see it the most is if you're, tra if you're actually tracking your data and you know how many leads are coming into the system and how many hires are happening because of that, you can see at each stage how the recruiters are actually doing, then you're at a basis level. You're like If you don't have that information, you should because otherwise it'll never improve. And so you'll be questioning, well, how much, why are we spending so much money on marketing? Um, it might be because your recruiter has, you know, a 4% close rate, and you don't even know that. They may just not be getting, or it could be that there is a big disconnect between when the lead comes in and they fill in an application. You just can't get them to fill in an application. Well, what's going on in that time frame? And so one of the areas that we talked about in the recruiter sales training is how are we responding to applicants? The, most common way is an applicant will come in and they will ask a question and we will be like a computer and we will spit the answer back to them. How much is your pay? Where, where are you drive? What are your routes? You know, we just, do you have, um, you know, uh, slip seating? You know, are you going to a certain location? And we're just this robot coming back and giving answers. And what happens is the recruiters complain about this all the time. It's all of a sudden, uh, potential applicant will go dark and they'll stop asking questions and they'll stop responding. Well, the problem was is that the applicant was always in control because whoever's asking the questions, they're the ones that are in control. So how can we change the communication around? And so the, one of the biggest things is when an applicant comes in is figuring out what's the question I can ask them back to them that I'm in control of the road of the conversation and they have to answer me. So it could be, you know, like we talked earlier about making assumptions, it could be, hey, I just want to, I'm wondering, what type of experience do you have in the past with forced or non-forced dispatch? And then they'll start a conversation with that. What's good about that is that they can tell you everything that's in their head about what they think about that, and now I can frame our company position and what we're doing in a way that says, well, we do it this way, and this is why it's a benefit to the driver. And so we're starting this conversation back and forth. So how we're interacting, if, if your job can be replaced by a computer, by a chat box, uh, that's not good. You need to actually be able to empathize with the driver, explore what they actually understand and what they know about what you're going to be offering, so that you can make sure that their expectations are going to line up with what we're offering. And that's probably where the biggest disconnect is for a lot of people, is you hear all the drivers say, well, recruiters lie to me all the time. I've been in these where recruiters are like, there is no way I told that driver that. Because it's, it's so far out of left field that there's no way that any of our recruiters said that. But the driver is at it. Like somebody said, it, the recruiters are liars, and so we're missing this piece of where is this conversation going to happen, so I can line up expectations with reality. Nick, what'd you get out of here? You were there. <laughs> Same thing. I mean, Phil talked quite a bit that day about how to choose your words correctly, and like you mentioned, not just spitting back answers like a chat box. Um, probably the biggest thing that I took out of it was how to frame. You know, a question back to that candidate in another form of 
question and give myself control of the conversation. So you know, we are a percentage-based pay company, so the first thing somebody asks a lot of times is how much do you pay per mile? Uh, but I, obviously, my easiest response is have you ever been paid based on percentage? Uh, and then if they will be able to say yes or no, you can ask what, you know, what their take on it, what do they think, what do they like, what do they not like. Um, and again, it gives me uh, the stage to, to frame my answer based on here's why we do it this way, and here's how it would benefit you if you've never been on percent based pay before. Um, so that helps a lot. That, that was my senior bill. Now, yes. Go ahead. I was going to say one of the big pieces is common driver objections. So if you have issues that you know are commonly coming up, how can you as a recruiter talk about those in a question format and figure out what they're going to think about ahead of time so that you're basically taking away any, any complaint that they would have, you're taking it away up front and finding out whether or not you and the driver have the same value. So if you do, then it's going to be a great fit. If you really can't come together, then it's not going to be a great fit. And so, there was examples of, you know, hey, our drivers hate the fact that we have speed governance in our truck. And they, they hate, you know, when another competitor, a large carrier that they, they mentioned, are passing them on the highway. And, and really, in a driver's mind, they're thinking, man, all I'm doing is I'm losing money because I have to drive at this speed and I can't drive two miles an hour faster. And so we went through the whole questioning aspect and we said, well, well what's your pay like? And compared to the competitor, what's your pay like? And it's like, well, we're two cents a mile more. It's okay, and then we, we brought them through this whole questioning sequence with the driver to say, all right, ask the driver, what percentage of the road do you think is gonna be at top speed? This road that you're driving? Well, maybe 20% of the road. Okay, let's figure out the math. Because we figured, we take them through the math itself and start ask, answering those questions and saying, you know, in the end, you're actually making more money even though your speed is being governed down. You're making more money because of the cents per mile. And you can actually do that math with them and get them to go, oh, I never looked at it that way. And that's all we're doing is we're changing the driver's filter to say, wow, I never saw it that way. The other piece of going through those things, especially those common complaints, is what I'm trying to do is for a lot of our drivers, they gotta sell this back to their spouse, right? Why are they changing companies again? This might be the fifth carrier they worked for in the last 12 years or whatever it is. And so what you're doing as a recruiter is you're actually giving them the tools to go back to say, the reason why, and, and I can tell you the reason why, they're not going to go back to this one and say, well, they're, they're a family environment. That's why they won't open this, because they told me they have a really good family culture. That's not what's going to make it a break. But if I can take those driver complaints out, that works. That's also when we talk about how retention can start in recruitment. Now we can take those away and we can start to say, hey, that complaint never even comes up. Because now, when the driver's going down the road and he's looking at this phenomenon and going, at you for stealing from me because they think you can just flip a switch, yeah. right? And I'd be making more money. They understand now up front that that's not necessarily the case. So, so I, I would just say that the, the virtuous cycle that you're creating there I think is really important. So a lot of, you know, we do a lot of uh, surveys and we focus on the early part of the drivers <laughs> working um, with that. And we consistently hear about mismatched expectations we can call it whatever we want, you know, they lied to me, they didn't hear what I said. It, it doesn't really matter on which side you want to take the blame. If somebody didn't understand something that was really important, and we have some statistics we'll talk about later about this problem of retaining drivers who you've worked so hard to get in, in the seat. But if you're in a relationship with them, now all of a sudden you're not just answering the questions, you stand out a lot more as a carrier because now you're in relationship and they can fine tune the answers um, to the questions and the questions that they're ans uh, asking of you. And, and now it really lessens the chance that we're going to be leaving right away because of a mismatch. And we have a tremendous industry wide problem of drivers leaving right away. Um, it's, it's it's pretty overwhelming. So I like that because it, it starts to impact that and cause and brings the driver and the company into alignment right away. And I think that's really critical. If, if that person's really just trying to get me off the phone, or if they really need to go speak with their wife, um, it gives me an opportunity to ask, what other questions do you think your spouse may have? And, again, that, that and the relationship part of that, you're really moving further down the road 
into relationship. So let's let's assume you know there's a fit, right? You had a great conversation. Uh, you get the driver uh, uh, to complete an application for employment. You know how many out here today who are still here who hire drivers are measuring uh, your your time to hire? You know what is just show of hands. Who's paying attention to that? Who's measuring that? And uh, and I'd like to know if you have any uh, input as far as how important is that? What is a what is a reasonable expectation? I hear, I mean, I hear all different timetables. But for us, for us personally, you know, we we determine hireability within 24 hours. Uh, after that 24 hours, we usually set up immediately a face-to-face -face interview with the candidate. We are lucky enough. Uh, we're only going to hire within a 60 mile radius of our home terminal. We only have one home. Um, so I, I physically do a face-to-face -face interview with every potential candidate just to get expectations on that same level. You know, we talk about it on the phone, but let's sit down face to face. Um, if we have time, if that person's not in a rush, I'll take you to get a cup of coffee and we'll sit down. You know, here's what we have to offer. Is this what you are expecting before we move forward? Um, well, obviously we try to do that, that face to face interview within that same week that we did that application. Uh, depending on that person's schedule, whether they're driving, working, uh, whatever, we'll, we'll work it out and get it done as quick as possible. But we try to start orientation or have orientation scheduled uh, within the same week we're receiving an application. So yeah, for a day, is anyway, single, single day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I, I guess my point, I, from looking at the data, I've seen you know, four weeks is too long, but 24 hours may be too short yeah. to figure out if it's a good fit. So there's probably a sweet spot, and it may be a little bit different by what you're hauling and how big you are and how many people are involved. But I think it starts with knowing, you know. I think it's how your recruiters. I think just being able to look at an application and know if this person is hireable right, right away yeah. um, can really kind of help help that recruiter know where to put their, their, their most priority ideas. Um, because if you know that person's hireable, you know that's what you get, you know, get to work on them. If you can immediately recognize I can't hire this person, you're not going to waste a bunch of time with you days tracking this person down, having phone calls, it's not true. They're right. not hired, right. so, um, just being able to get that hard as quick as possible. Is, is so we had a best practice that I just became aware of. One of our clients talked about hireability. Um, they had very specific criteria um, that not everybody was hireable. But the, a lot of drivers still would be good drivers for somebody else. And they maintain a relationship with other carriers and said, you know, we're not going to be a good fit for this reason, but if you get X more experience or some other whatever, you know, we think that you can be a good fit for, and they actually need other people that they do. And again, what what's so different? It's like, I'm not telling you to go away and I never want to hear from you again. I'm like, hey, you're not quite ready, or maybe you just can't quite, but I, but you know, you Here's, I want to help you out, and again, preserving that relationship, that reputation that you have of being different and better. It's a very interesting way of thinking about that. And I think Nick, you mentioned earlier that uh, you know drivers who recognize drivers are probably applying to multiple multiple companies. So in some cases, I think uh, if all else is the same, if, 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 if to the driver the impression is that all these companies are virtually the same, cops seem to be the same, seem to be kind of the same type of company. Uh, who can who? More efficiently, who is faster? Uh, I think that's where it probably uh, really makes a difference. So, you know, and, and for sake of time, I want to make sure that we, you know, we get through that hiring process and, and move into retention. Before we do, just through that hiring process, what are some of the bigger snags that you experience, and and and, and how do you circumvent them, get around them? Obviously, not sacrificing safety or compliance, but how can you? How can you qualify a driver faster and more efficiently in order to, to, to be ahead of the, the other carriers? Yeah, the, the biggest hack for myself is the face-to-face -face interview uh, with that person. Uh, so they may be full-time driving right now. They may be in California. So um, obviously the easiest answer for that is just to be an actual uh, Skype or Facebook video messenger interviews. We'll do interviews that way just to you know, help that process stay efficient so that driver can make a decision. So when they get back, they're going to make the move that they might get me to go very few weeks. Chad, do you see any of this in your uh, companies that you're working with? 
Yeah, I mean, most of the companies, the, the biggest thing is the verification of employment. You know, it always takes a while to get all that information back. Um, unless they're using a system that's automatically throwing that out there and trying to use technology to solve it. Um, so that is probably, for a lot of them, you know, that's a couple days. Uh, some of them are requiring, you know, some of the information like that from background checks. Um, and they're just refusing to take some of that information piecemeal, which they didn't even know they could. Uh, first wait for the entire reports to come back. Um, so they decided to wait on that thing. So sometimes that, that ends up taking a lot longer. And really what you're trying to do is I'm really trying to take that driver off the market uh, for anybody else before you can do it. If I can, if I can offer that driver what he's looking for and I can offer him orientation a week later and get him going on a load, that's my best case scenario. If it's taking longer than that, then all I'm doing is I'm just putting more time to the uh, potential problems to lose that driver. Yeah, you mentioned the, the free to plug in and getting that information right away. I remember a long time ago when I was hiring drivers uh, for my staffing company for a long time, uh, that I write, and it was a database previous employment history. You know, Todd was here speaking earlier, and that's still a large growing database, but uh, but there are others now as well, driver IQs, I've done these driver facts, POE plus, and these are ones I think that can help expedite that as well. But I think I agree, I think it's an important part, because you can run an MBR in seconds, you know, I mean, you get a lot of that information back right away, but it's the previous employment Stack from, a, from a qualification standpoint, uh, and that's a little different than your, your, yours is more of a policy, you know, standpoint than, than actually the qualification. Um, I do want to get into the retention though, because when, when, when once a driver's hired, you know, how do you? And this is really probably I think directly first with Mary. How do you? Uh, how do you get that relationship started on the right foot from the beginning? And I assume it probably starts with the recruiter, but I mean, you know, you when that handoff takes place. Honestly, I, you know, I think one of the, the other pieces that is the, the intentional design of the orientation. You know, um, that's just, you know, how a driver is treated during that part of it, and you know, um, who they're meeting with, and how they're getting to know the team, and the use, how their time is being used. Is there stuff that you can offload to computer learning? Um, and so that the time that you invest with them is spent creating relationships with their fleet managers and dispatchers safety and maintenance of the people that are going to be settlement people, the, the people that are going to be very important to him or her along the way. Um, you know, I've only attended one orientation for driving, and I don't know that I could have stayed the whole day. And I certainly didn't feel at the end that I would want to stay with the company. It was sort of an afterthought as opposed to the most impressive thing. And that's again all within your power to create a really impressive time spent with them to show them how gentle you are, to, to encourage them um, to bring problems forward, to talk about um, how you help them problem solve and how vested you are in them being, being there. Um, I know you've done some very cool things with your orientation. Go ahead and share some of those. Yeah, so our orientation, I mean, sometimes we get people on the phone that out organizations four days long, but you know, one day's a ride along, so we take that off. The other three days, we actually take um, and schedule that driver with each at least one representative from each department in the building. Um, it's usually a 15 to a 30 minute, uh, basically just a meeting group. So that person will explain to the, the new hire driver what their job is on a daily basis, how long they've been with the company, you know, kind of get to know the person uh, in a in addition, you know, they talk about what they do every day, what they need from that driver to be able to do their job every day, what that driver can expect from them if they ever need something or if they ever have issues. So a payroll, for example, that driver has already met our payroll person for at least a half hour. Um, that person or that, that driver knows exactly who to call. They've met that person before. And they say, hey, I need some attention with this. Or, I don't know how to read this or whatever. One thing we've done from our retention side as well, uh, it's getting ready to start. So rather than just our recruiters doing the surveys uh, and other things like that, we're actually having at the end of the second full week of driving for the driver, that payroll firm is actually calling the driver to do the retention follow-up. Did you receive your email pay stuff? Did everything look correct on there? Did you understand how to read it? And then the following week, I'm actually following up with the driver on how that phone call went with the payroll person. Uh, just helping again, you know, put 
push them towards knowing more people within the company rather than just having a relationship with the driver manager and previous relationship with the manager. So Jeremy, could you give a slide three for just a sec? Just three to go in. That one right there. So um, what, what you're hearing is a really good example of um, what's called the socialization process. And the socialization process happens to all of us, every employee that you have. Uh, we're indebted to the work of John Calhoun Mueller at the University of Minnesota, who studied how people go from being outside of an organization to inside of it. And what you're talking about is they go through three distinct phases on it. The first phase is what we were originally talking about, sort of that recruitment and selection, and you can again design that particular process. And then their orientation, their first encounter. What is that like when they're first trying you out when they're there? What is that experience like? And then the third is sort of the metamorphosis, if you will. They, they go from being quasi-outsider to actually one of you. And what the, we spend is lifetime working as uh, at this insider, to, uh, sorry, outsider to insider. And what he knows is that each of those steps is additive and better experiences that each one of those steps have the ability to affect productivity, um, commitment, and retention. So if you do better at each one of those steps, the chances are you're going to create a situation where with the driver, or again, it could be an employee, and all of us have gone through this. Think about your last job when you were an outsider and then you started to feel like you're part of the team. Um, that the higher productivity, commitment, and, and likelihood of stay comes when you do each of those steps better. And my argument is that all of the things that, that we've been talking about are things that make each of those steps better. And designing each of those steps differently is the great opportunity that you all have Nobody else gets to design them for you. They may get undesigned because of inattention or leaving it to chance, but the great opportunity that you all have is to really design those and affect your outcomes. I think we underestimate how much each of those phases affects the outcome. And again, the outcomes, productivity, commitment, and retention. So one area that I see on there that we've done a lot with is the pre-arrival stage. And what I would say by pre-arrival is the day of the accepted offer to that span between the days when there's orientation, so there's a gap in there, the driver's gonna show up. Um, because people have an issue with ghosting, so that was, you know, the driver just doesn't show up the orientation. So how can we get past that? Um, one thing you mentioned earlier, Nick, was the spouse. So we actually have a communication marketing plan for that time frame, um, and one of those pieces is a piece that goes home. And it's a very in-depth piece, for whoever's at home to see, and it goes through, here's all the expectations, here's all the benefits of this company, the things that differentiate us, and it goes as a little binder back home. So that's one piece, because we want the person back home to be on our side, because drivers are gonna have a bad day at some point, we want, we want the at home to be on our side at that point. Um, there's other messages that go in there too. It's, there's, here's the letter of expectation, things that we talked about, that we agreed on. Here's, please sign this and understand this is what we did talk about. So, you're doing things like telling drivers, hey, our average pay is X. But the problem comes in sometimes for drivers when you hire them in January and their, and their average miles in January is not the same as the average of the full year. And so like, if that's a common complaint, that's one of the pieces of information that we put on that letter for that carrier saying, hey, we wanna let you know, we talked about this average miles, this is what they look like in January, February, March, and you can see what that is. Right now we're in February, so this is what you can expect in February, where we're gonna be bumping up in the summertime when soda sales hit, you know, whatever that's going to be. So there's a letter of expectation in there that they understand, addressing those kind of complaints. We have spousal marketing that goes out to their home. Um, and then there's a couple other pieces that are just like, a, hey, we're so glad you're part of the team. We're welcome to be here. And some of that is mail and print, some of that is phone call, and some of that is email. So you can do all three of those pieces. And so think about what you could possibly do in there with all those pieces of communication. And those are really some good concrete steps that you could take back next week. And I think, and Gary, you stole my thunder a little bit. I was going to uh, set you up for some of these slides, but because you've got a couple other really good ones that I want you to uh, be able to speak to. Uh, but I think it's clear here that, uh, that it's, it's the driver's perspective that we're you know, considering, and the experience that we're referring to, is it's got to be a good experience for the driver in all of these uh, uh, phases. Um, I'm not sure if any of your uh, slides would speak to this question, so you know, let me know if I should uh, uh, flip to 
one of them, but what are you seeing are some of the uh, driver retention initiatives that companies are, are putting in place for new drivers to that? Some of the most effective ones that you've seen. Okay. So, I, I, I think I'll only heard from Nick and Chad talking about um, a lot of these. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is, is um, from our survey. So we survey drivers when they're relatively new. So about a week or so after their you know, early onboarding experiences. And then we survey them um, a little bit later um, during their early driving experiences. And so we see people responding to the survey. But one of the things that we use those surveys for is to allow a driver to say, I'm having a real problem here. I don't understand something. And we, it creates a notification back to the company to say, hey, here's a driver who's asked for an intervention. They have a question. They don't understand something. They're, they're unsure of something. And it's an easy way to keep that relationship, building on that relationship. You don't want them all feeling like, oh, if I ask a question, someone's going to ding me or whatever. We don't want you to ask those questions. And so we're developing effective systems for responding to those particular questions. And then fixing the things that they're confused about. And I think Chad's example of showing them the pay differently is a really, really important one. There's a lot of disconnect between what they think they're going to be paid and what they may be paid right away. And showing them and helping them to understand that for the first X months, this is what it's going to look like. And then making sure that there's alignment, that there's there's truth telling between what the recruiter is saying and what the driver is hearing. Um, we see examples like that um, all the time, getting better at the data at what a specific carrier is challenged with, um, and then um, fixing that for the driver, whatever it might be. As you mentioned, split seating, you know, drivers may or may not want to be in split seat, and if you don't happen to mention it, and it happens to be the way that you go, they're very upset right away. And so actually it's not the slip seating, it's generally the condition that the cab was left in by the person prior. And so then you can really work on fixing that. How do you prepare to run that way? How do you fix that kind of thing? So there's lots of great examples like that. And I'm gonna- One thing with the surveys too, Toby, we've noticed that you know, they're the same thing over and over and over again. They get stale, you just give the, yeah, it's all fine. It's out of place. But one thing we do is we actually tailor each survey towards milestones within their tenure with us. So, you know, like I said, that 10th day, they're going to get off the payroll. We know they're getting their first real value paycheck from us. Um, our insurance benefits, for example, take effect on day 60. So, on that 45 day phone call that we give them, we're going to make sure they A, got their insurance cards in the mail. Um, you know, they understand how the deductible works, they understand how our deductible reimbursement policy works, um, any questions they may have with insurance. Um, so just try to tie the you know, milestones within, within the tenure with you know, different uh, surveys to keep things fresh and keep them always talking about it. On the surveys, uh, so what you're suggesting is that we should actually encourage feedback. On the operation side, you know, the driver, long haul driver calls in, he's like, hey, uh, so I've been thinking, you're like, ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> so, you know, so you want to change that attitude, right? I mean, you want, you don't want that response from, from the operational team, you know, dispatch folks. Um, is it safe to say that, that, that that group has the biggest impact on the driver's tenure, uh, you know, post hire? Dispatch, you know, team or, you know, they might have built some good rapport with the recruiter, you know, uh, and then and then they may not deal with that recruiter anymore. And now they're dealing with yeah, it's a person, you know, whether they're whatever the title is, whether yeah. they're their manager, fleet manager, dispatcher, you know, that person now has an awful lot to do with the driver's perception of what's happening to him or her. Is yeah. it fair? Is it right? Are the promises being lived up to? And that's actually where we see some interesting opportunities from the surveys. It's a lot of places are silent, so you see recruiting here, and you see orientation here, and you see fleet management here. And the driver experiences all of those things and gets different messages or slightly different messages from everybody. And then they, you know, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when you get slightly different messages from some people, don't you disregard all of them and then start your own poll? Like who's 
really going to tell me what's going on. You know, and so we see a lot of places working to make sure that those messages are aligned and coordinated. And so what's happening to them in their early driving with their fleet manager or their dispatcher, that those messages are very much the same that they heard in orientation, which is very much the same that they heard while they were being recruited. And I would encourage you to look at your messages and see where there are differences and similarities in them and really work on aligning them. That is a big reason that drivers tell us they leave. They, they say it's a broken promise. Um, it's usually the word that they use. Um, but the reality is something was out of alignment from what they thought they were going to experience. I think your recruiters would simply ask as well in, in the survey calls. Uh, one thing I ask all the time is how well did I do preparing you for what you were experiencing on, on the first recount? Um, feedback there is it was great not only for driver to know what they feel like they need to get something off their chest, but also gives me an opportunity to re-explain something if something might have been inferred or mis misinterpreted. Um, yeah, the recruiter can be afraid to ask either, but the transition from the recruiter to the pilot manager um, has to be as smooth as possible. During our welcome week, or we call it welcome week, not orientation, but I actually walk that driver to the driver manager during that week for their sit down. I sit down for the first you know, five or ten minutes during their sit down, I purposely get up and walk away just to let them, you know, talk one on one without somebody else kind of there feel like they're just listening. <coughs> so I want to make sure that that transition is there. One thing we do as well is we have a designated driver manager for new drivers, whether it be from driving school um, or all the way up to they've got 20 years of experience. When you come on, we have one person that has it. Eight English drivers, period. And that's all they have. That's all they deal with. And we stress that if you have any sort of question, any sort of issue, if you just want to call and talk because you're fresh out of driving school and you used to sell insurance for a way to drive you the plan B, call that driver manager and, and just talk about whatever you want to talk about. They've only got eight other people to talk to. So, so that, the idea that you're, you're less a manager at that point, you're really not a mentor. Right. And you're seeing a lot of that in a really important part of the transition, too, is really helping to mentor people into your company, because your company is different than every other one. Exactly. So even if a person's been driving for 20 years, you know, state metrics is going to do something different than you know, driving does. So having that person available as kind of the, the mentor or the liaison to that person to help, um, you know, kind of get them settled in and comfortable before they move on to a driver manager who has 30 drivers. So that person is going to have more questions. We want a person available to pick up the phone and answer the question. I think we've established that, that, that getting feedback is, is important, is valuable. And it's really two, two questions that are kind of coupled with that that I, that I want to ask and then just open it up for some questions before, before we wrap up. Um, you know, again, we, we know it's important to, to get uh, feedback. What are, the, what are the implications if we don't do anything about it? One and the other, uh, how can we recognize maybe some warning signs of uh, uh, drivers and, and maybe and, and who might otherwise leave abruptly? You know, kind of prevent that from happening. I think you know that's so prevention. You know, would be would be great. So if you guys can speak to those couple of uh, points. That'd be great. I think if you don't do anything about it, you know, if you're going to gather all this information and not take it to heart, sometimes. It's not easy information to hear. Uh, once you process it, you realize, hey, I might not be doing something right, or I might not be making this person's transition as smooth as possible. Um, being willing to do act on the feedback, I think, is the biggest thing. Because if you don't, you know, your early turn rate is going to stay high, or your early exit rate is going to stay high, and your overall turn rate will stay high. Or might it get higher? I, 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 I'm pretty passionate about this one. And whether it's surveys or focus groups, or suggestion boxes, whatever way you're getting feedback, I, you're asking somebody to take the time to tell you what they think. I think it's the ultimate form of disrespect. Like, I cannot imagine anything more disrespectful than to, to ask somebody to spend their time tell you what's wrong and completely ignore them. And, you know, drivers already tell us that they don't feel respected too often. Um, and it's just such, a, it's such an incredibly silly thing to do as a company.
company, and, and, and again, it would be a state venture agency or Jeremy's company or any, any company that asks for feedback and then doesn't do anything with it. I mean, the, at the very least, you can say thank you for your feedback. It's not a direction we're going to go right now, but we may use that information in the future. But it is it's tremendously disrespectful not to get back to people and say we heard you. This is where we can change. This is where we won't change. But we heard you, and I, I feel it's almost like if you decided that you're going to get data and you're not going to put together a plan to do something with it. I actually think you don't. You're not ready to get data. You know, don't don't do it because you set people up for the expectation that you're going to do something, and and it's it's really not a good thing to do. So, when you turn it over, just real quickly, Jeremy, can you just show the last slide for one minute? Because I don't that one right there. I just want to point out that um, that we're still as an industry, just sharing this with you, we're still struggling with getting this right. So we looked at all of our data from last year, and the, the takeaway from this table is that drivers that started uh, in January of 2018, um, only about 40% of them made it 365 days. And we're, you know, it, to me it's just a shocking number. Um, and I'm thinking if I'm a driver, and I'm talking to our road team earlier at lunch today, I said, if I'm, if I'm a driver, I may start to ask you, if I decide to come to you, what's the chance that I can make it 365 days with you? Right now, it's, it's, it's 40, 60 that I will. Um, although not for you, because <laughs> your drivers are staying a lot longer. But I just want to point that out. This, this issue of we're working so hard to get them in, and then transitioning them and having them stay, is still a real ongoing problem. We've done a couple of analyses, statemetrics.com, you can get the paper on it. But it's, this is still a real issue, is getting um, drivers through those different phases. Um, and, uh, and again, we do a lot of surveys, and what we consistently hear is that the sense of a broken promise, expectation about equipment or pay, and then it varies, um, equipment, pay, route, loads, um, are all missed somewhere between the recruiting part and the driving part. So um, I'm glad we had a chance to start to talk about it, but you can see that it's still an issue out there that to really right. address. But you can't bury your head the same. No, no, not at, all. not at all. One thing with surveys is one thing that I like to do if you're, if you're giving them a survey where you can actually identify who hasn't responded, those are the people that you should be having somebody in your team to follow up. With um, they're the most disengaged, probably, and they more than likely have the most complaints. Actually, um, are the people that weren't responding to the survey. So one of the biggest things I think is organizational structure. So if you're not structured in a way that has somebody in your team who's responsible for doing those follow-up calls, if you don't have someone that's responsible for enacting the changes that you're getting out of the survey, which means that it's not going to happen, then you need to do that first. There's an organizational structure that needs to happen. Even with the recruiters, the recruiter should have enough time to call drivers who've already been working for you because part of their good recruitment process is that they want to be able to say, hey, I was talking to one of our drivers last week and they said this to a potential applicant. If they can't say that, you don't give them the time to do that because you're saying you need to be on the phone call with 100 people a day. Um, your structure is preventing that from happening. And so you're saying the churn is okay as long as I can recruit. Uh, and so what you're doing operationally is affecting your retention. So there's things to look at from that standpoint. I want to want to thank everybody and be respectful of time. We could go on and on for a long time. I see Tim in the back there. Good to see you. Uh, I'm curious if there's an opportunity to uh, just at least open it up to some questions before we uh, before we uh, dig on for the rest of the day. So anything related to recruiting, uh, onboarding, retention, anything like that? That we can talk about. This is, by the way, everyone's contact information here if uh, uh, you'd like to jot that down. But anyway, come at me. Request for APUs. Is that something that, uh, uh, Nick, is that something that you experienced with, uh, with your fleet? Yeah, so part of our fleet is APU powered. So we do get the question asked 
Um, not all of our fleet is a out multiple night type of fleet, so not all of our trucks are a and equipped. Um, I, I mean, my, our answer to that is if you are on a load that requires an APD, yes, you'll be in one way to equip the truck. But what was, what was the point? Was that a question? Yeah, it's a, it's a, and I, you know, discussion point. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Well, I think I, I speak for, for all of us here. Thank you for, uh, for sticking around uh, to the last hour. Now we've all got to uh, drive back in Indiana traffic, which is not so bad. But uh, hopefully, you were able to take away some, uh, some, some, some good, uh, you know, practical uh, uh, feedback to, uh, to your, to your operations in one way or another. And uh, appreciate you guys being here. This is a, I hope hopefully you like this venue. I think it was a great place. Um, so hats off to uh, to Gary, Barb, and uh, Sally for for organizing this. And uh, hopefully this is where we'll be at uh, for a few other events. I think it's been great. So thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.